was uh, just spent uh, some time in the past couple of days reviewing a bit on um, some important aspects that I've, I've found useful to bring into consideration, contemplation, in a way pertaining to some of my trajectory into this path and what uh, some of the quintessential and most important teachings that helped solidify my interest and inspiration. Because when I was, I think I've always you know, had this kind of penchant for uh, the spiritual search, even uh, starting probably in my early teens, uh, middle teens, kind of finding myself being sort of a, a dreamer. You may call me a dreamer, I think. That's some imagine song. <laughs> You may call me a dreamer. Anyway, I was always, I found myself often kind of just not sure about uh, life, feeling a bit out of place, awkward, kind of what's this all about? <laughs> on a personal level, but also on kind of a broader level, kind of just that sense of our place in the cosmos, what does it all mean, growing up in a Christian tradition that was interesting to some extent. I found myself interested in the religious aspect of my upbringing, but not finding a lot of completion or sense of confidence in, in, in that particular approach to the spiritual questions of life. So I spent a lot of my time musing, speculating, dreaming, wondering how this little life in this little body uh, related to the world at large, the cosmos, the grand scheme of things. Found myself entering into some of the more colorful spiritual paths of, of the time, this being in the later 60s, 70s, moving into the six, you know, late 60s, early 70s, and all the stuff that everybody knows was going on along at that time. Just being on the kind of the, the slightly later end of the whole consciousness revolution, the drug scene and all that stuff, getting lost in some of the, the different uh, ways that spirituality was, was being explored, the whole age of Aquarius. Everybody remember the age of Aquarius? Whatever happened to the age of Aquarius? <laughs> it seems like it uh, was supposed to be manifesting sometime around now, and it, I don't know if it's come and gone or if we're still in it, but all of its promises from the astrological perspective seem to be happening in the world around us. Harmony and understanding and revelations and true liberation. So, but I doggedly uh, kind of got myself involved in some of those kind of alternative spiritual paths, psychic healing and, and uh, some sorts of, of meditation, usually designed to you know, explore some expanded state of consciousness but never really finding much sustenance in it. It's all, all kind of fluffy stuff, at least uh, from my experience. And then also, you know, on the more personal narrative level, uh, the normal dukkha that we all are experiencing and how does that all tie into, you know, a vast cosmic plan. So still dreaming, searching on this uh, just trajectory that I didn't know where it might be going. And then... Being very fortunate to discover the Buddha's teachings sometime later down the line. And all of a sudden realizing, oh my gosh, here is a teaching and a training that pulls so much of this together. It acknowledges both the, the vast level of uh, consciousness that exists in the, in the cosmos and points to you know, an acknowledgement of that, if not a celebration of that. And it also pulls in on a very personal level, our experience of, of unsatisfactoriness of dukkha. And it weaves a whole view that acknowledges the existence of all of these layers of, of experience uh, in its variations, and also uh, points to a transcendence of all of it. So I kind of fast forward to uh, gaining some experience in meditation and being exploring certain Buddhist teachings and then uh, getting involved with this tradition as a layperson and eventually connecting with the Western tradition of Ajahn Chah and 
delving more and more deeply into the teachings and being particularly affected by what seemed to be an emphasis on right view, this whole container for the path, as, as, as the Buddha talks about in some of the teachings, the, you know, right view is the, the forerunner of, of the Noble Eightfold Path, everything revolving around it. And then one of the first exposures that I had to that uh, in my early years before exploring the monastic life was uh, when Lung Pao was visiting the West and ended up teaching a short retreat at Cloud Mountain and uh, I was lucky enough to be there. And the topic uh, that he centered it, that retreat around was, was on right view. Remember that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> 1989. Yeah, so um, I, I was overjoyed. And in fact, the... The friend that I dragged along with me, <laughs> kind of against his will, <laughs> was so impressed that uh, he actually commented on it. Said, oh, that was really very useful. So anyway, right view was was what came up in that uh, in that retreat, and and you know I don't remember all the details of of, of what Lin Pa taught uh, on that, but uh, just really appreciating how it you know the the right view of the Buddha, the teachings of right view or essentially around the Four Noble Truths, and I'm sure he uh, expounded on that to a good extent, but also bringing in the qualities that always felt as so important to me uh, in teachings, various spiritual teachings, but never came together until uh, the, I was exposed to the Buddha's uh, view, and, and that's of uh, the law of cause and effect, karma, and also the possibility of, of spiritual transcendence, moving away from this whole realm of conditions and dukkha. And that those are integral parts of, of right view and very explicit. Uh, there is kama, there is rebirth, there is a path that describes uh, the unsatisfactoriness of it, as well as the way leading to its complete transcendence. Uh, and I'd never come across this in any of the various and sundry explorations that I had gone through in, in all the different spiritual aspects. Some would address some of those things, but uh, never in completion with, with a full comprehension. And I remember that particular retreat as, as being one that helped to really bring things together. So right view is something that yeah, the Buddhist right view is 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 very unique, and, and we were having some tea time discussions in the past couple of days, uh, and with a bit of an interreligious component to it too. Some discussing some of the other views, uh, say, uh, in, around Christianity, but and it didn't really go this way. But in some of those discussions, at times, I think there's often a lot of emphasis around trying to establish a sense of comfort that uh, no matter what our path, we're all going to the same place. And you know, the many paths up the mountain, but the, the peak is, 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 the, is, is one uh, ending. And I guess I have to say that I'm, I'm not convinced that that's the case. And, and I think that the Buddha does offer some unique perspectives that other traditions don't, taking us beyond even you know, heavens and hells and, and even beyond the ultimate oneness with all unity taking us even beyond these extremely exalted states that uh, some spiritual traditions say we can uh, attain and maintain. So uh, in addition to all of the incredible practical aspects of the Buddhist path, this overarching theme of uh, transcendence and the fact that we have the ability to realize that through establishing causes and conditions that lead us in that direction. Not really coming to start to understand that just answered all of my needs as a spiritual dreamer. So the teachings on right view, I think there's a lot of them in the, in the Buddhist, the Pali Canon, many different ways that it's described and approached and the various components of it. But again, to me, the major thrust being uh, the law of, of Kama and the possibility of transcendence through understanding completely the Four Noble Truths. 
But there's also some other teachings that I found very useful to, to rec recollect every now and then. And there's one that I pick up every now and then to help structure some contemplation and kind of review where I'm, some of my weak spots might be in practice and to shore things up a little bit. But uh, uh, also just uh, as kind of a review of uh, certain aspects of, of, of right view. And it, and it comes in one of the teachings in the Majjhima Nikaya that's expounding on the six principles of, of cordiality, the Saraniya Dhammas, very nice teaching, the Kosambians, Majjhima something, I can't remember, 60-something. But Anyway, the, I won't go into all the six aspects or the six um, conditions, characteristics for, for establishing harmony, for establishing cordiality, but the sixth one is uh, having a common view sharing the, the noble transcendent view of, of right view, essentially, that uh, people living together will live harmoniously if they share that view in common with each other, the understanding of, of uh, right view, samaditi. And there's several ways that that manifests, and one can explore that and see if they are present in one's own experience. And it's also not only to see if it's present as someone who might be considered to be fully on the path, but also as contemplations to see, okay, well, if this isn't present in me, can I work towards helping to, to bring them into being, to, to develop them? And I try and go through them every now and then just to refresh my memory. There's seven, uh, seven of these qualities uh, that the Buddha talks about such that uh, if they're present, it helps to establish one in this right view, or it's an acknowledgement that one is established in this right view. The first one is it knowing and reviewing that one's mind is free from a certain number of obsessions, I don't know what the poly is uh, in that, but uh, uh, freedom from obsessions that are included like the, in terms of the hindrances, so that one knows that one is free from the obsession of sensual desire, from the obsession of irritability or ill will, from dullness and drowsiness, the obsession of anxiety and agitation, the obsession of, of doubt. And if not always free from them, that, that one at least has experienced freedom from them at, at periods uh, in their, their practice, periods in their life. And also free from uh, the obsession of uh, holding to speculative views about the nature of the world, the nature of cosmos, the nature of self, and avoiding any disputes, arguments, entanglements uh, regarding the holding of those speculative views. So one can feel confident that one is a holder of this view that is noble and emancipating, as it goes, uh, if one is free from these obsessions, at least uh, has experienced freedom from these obsessions at times. One can also feel like they've been established in this noble view, noble right view, if they have this uh, sense that with this freedom from these obsessions, that there's a sense of, or an experience of calmness, serenity, tranquility, as well as insight. That, so that in this, these moments of, of freedom from the, the first set of obsessions, that there is a real true settling of the mind, a true experience of pulling together and of gleaning insight, inspiration from that quietude of mind, from that freedom from obsessions. So reviewing to see if those have been experienced and are present with a certain level of confidence. The third one is, a, is kind of an interesting one in that uh, person uh, reviewing uh, this view of that's noble and emancipating looks around and, and explores to see if there's any other dispensation uh, in, that exists in the world that also has this same view, this, these qualities of the teaching that takes one to, to full transcendence, and realizing that actually, at least in terms of the Buddha's description of the ending of the path, the completion of the path, no, there is no other dispensation that will take one to that place. That's a realization, that's an understanding of somebody who is fully enmeshed in the path. And I think the Buddha did a really skillful job at it, kind of answering those questions about 
do all religions, do all practices lead to the same path? And, and his response was, well, any other teaching that does involve all aspects of the Eightfold Path, which includes right view and the teachings of the Four Noble Truths, if there were other teachings that included the entirety of what he describes as the, as the Eightfold Path, then yes, that would lead to the same place. But he didn't see that that existed anywhere, at least at that time. So I thought that was a skillful way of not negating or not kind of saying, well, the Buddha's way is the only way, but saying, well, what would the qualifications be to make it one with a similar destination? So the re person, the reviewer of these qualities would, would, would realize, no, this is, uh, this is the only path that leads to complete cessation of, of suffering and independence. And then the next couple of reviewing qualities are what the Buddha calls uh, characteristics of uh, somebody who is on this path completely uh, and confidently. And that is, these, the, do they have the character of seeing danger in the slightest fault so that uh, even if one who is on the path makes a mistake and transgresses one of the precepts in some way, then they would, as soon as they recognize and, and realize that they've done that, they immediately find some way to acknowledge and, as a bhikkhu, uh, find someone to confess with. That the mind is so sensitive to wrongdoing that when one does that through through one's ignorance of since one since most of us haven't completed the path mistakes are possible but they result in such a sensitivity this sense of hiri otopa that it has to be acknowledged and dealt with as soon as possible before the person can rest comfortably so seeing the danger seeing the slightest uh, the danger in the slightest fault and responding to it and another characteristic of someone firmly on this path also would be that even if they're busy and involved with many activities supporting Sangha life, that they still have this great appreciation for the training in, in higher sila, higher virtue, higher, the higher mind, the teaching, uh, the training in the higher mind, and the training in higher wisdom. Uh, and that whatever they do, whatever they're caught up with, they're involved with, uh, that there's always a turning back to how can I make this part of these three trainings so that I don't neglect practice and encourage others to do that as well. And then the, the last two are what he calls uh, the strengths of, of somebody on this, with this kind of right view. And that's when listening to Dhamma, when engaging in Dhamma discussion or, or hearing teachings, one does so with a, a rapt interest, as the Buddha describes a, a phraseology of, of listening with eager ears. So that listening to teachings, uh, exploring the path, one engages fully and wholly in, in that, that listening to the teachings, that consideration of the teachings. One is drifting, daydreaming, getting distracted, and the, the mind is fully composed and collected right in that moment. We were having, uh, again, a, the tea time discussion about what is samadhi, and it doesn't have to be this very small, one-pointed focus of attention, a very tiny point. In fact, as Ajahn Amra was describing at tea time, there were examples of people realizing the levels of, of emancipation, different levels of freedom, liberation, while listening to teachings. And so the mind wasn't in a very exclusive, narrow point of concentration, but in a broader form of samadhi that was able to receive and understand teachings and attain certain levels of understanding through that level of samadhi. So this is a, a sense of the broadness of, of sama samadhi, right samadhi, that it can be so broad and encompassing, but still very single-pointed around a particular theme. Rather than a single point, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, the mind is holding to very closely, very attentively to a, a theme to such an extent that one is able to realize the, the fruits of the practice right then and there. So this 
form of listening intently, listening with the whole heart, with all of one's attention, holding that level of composure, of collectedness uh, around a particular teaching, listening with eager ears and realizing the benefits from that. And that's what the seventh one is, too, is gaining inspiration, gaining understanding when one is involved in exploration of the teachings. And that this is the, the final uh, reviewing knowledge, if, if you will, of somebody who is firmly implanted with right view. So to use these reflections, to use these benchmarks in a sense, not only to see where one might be along the path, but also as ways of finding where weaknesses might be shored up, whether it's in the, the settling of the mind or the various characteristics and strengths uh, that we want to have, as mentioned in these seven reviewing knowledges, as they're called, the seven reviewing knowledges. They're very useful uh, ways of reflecting on uh, right view. So to me, that really expanded the teachings on right view. It's not just a collection of the, you know, the various aspects of it as it's described, but also a very useful tool to see, am I one who is possessed of right view, or at least has moments of being possessed of right view? And if not, how can I develop those? So just to, you know, bringing it back full circle again, just realizing that the centrality of, of this teaching and to me how it just pulled together so many of my questions and, and my yearnings and my speculations and my musings uh, as a spiritual dreamer. And to keep that alive when you know, we fall upon doubt or difficult periods of time, it's okay to kind of just sit back and be a bit of a dreamer. Where is what? What was my original inspiration? Where was my motivation to start this? Can I rekindle that? Do I really want to just get trapped in mundane trappings of the world, which is so easy to do these days? Reviving that sense of what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What can I do to to bring a sense of inspiration and wholeness? and make some sense of my place in, in the cosmos, my place in the world, and how to realize how both on a, a very small internal level and on a very large cosmological level, I can work towards understanding and, and freedom, not only from my daily dukkha, but also the dukkha of this vast conditioned world of, of the universe and, and our constant enmeshment with it since beginningless time. Do I want to stay enmeshed in my own small world inside and uh, in the world of the, uh, of the cosmos, or do I want to seek a way to find freedom from all of it and to walk the path uh, that leads to that freedom and then to help others along the way too? This is, I think, the what can result uh, if we just allow ourselves to do that kind of, of dreaming. So I'll just leave that for a few reflections this evening.